Welcome to the Backyard Professor Responds videos. I'm going to respond to David A. Bednar's October General Conference talk for 2024, where he uses Samuel the Lamanite, and he talks about the prophetic Book of Mormon being a book for the future for the church, and I'll grant that premise to him. He's in the Book of Helaman for the most part. Let's take a look. I've got some clips I want to share from his talk that uh, I wish to discuss. And first off, I need to share the screen. So let me share that screen. Here we go. Make sure it's on. Okay, there we go. Okay, here we go. In his words. Perhaps the most stunning and sobering aspect of this decline into apostasy by the Nephites is the fact that all these iniquities did come unto them in the space of not many years. How could a once righteous people become hardened and wicked in such a short period of time? How could people so quickly forget the God who had blessed them so abundantly? In a powerful and profound way, the negative example of the Nephites is instructive for us today. Yes, it is. And the way Elder Bednar contextualizes this is close to criminal, as far as I'm concerned. Let me share some more, and I will describe why I make such a startling claim. Pride began to enter into the hearts of the people who professed to belong to the Church of God because of their exceedingly great riches and their prosperity in the land. They set their hearts upon riches in the vain things of this world because of that pride which they suffered to enter into their hearts, which lifted them up beyond that which is good because of their exceeding great riches. The issue here is exceeding great riches. Now, I am not a rich man. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to retire as far as that goes. I have next to nothing. I live in a very small house, etc., etc. I don't have any of the fun toys at all. Exceeding great riches, the church has come forward, and because it was fined by the SEC for illegal maneuverings of their money, it was fined and it accepted to pay that fine and admission to the guilt. It's not about the size of the fine, like several Mormon apologists have said. It's the fact that they admitted they were guilty, and they paid that fine. You can find this on YouTube. Look it up. SEC fines and Mormonism. So exceeding great riches. If you take a dollar bill in U.S. currency, it is 0 0.0043 inches thick. If assuming these lay flat, you set them up on top of one another in a pile and pile them up, 200 billion of them. They have admitted they have a lot of money that they are simply hoarding. They're not doing anything with except making more money with it in their investments. The height of that pile of $200 billion $1 bills is, would anyone care to guess? It will blow your freaking minds. 13,784 miles high. Now, by any definition you can come up with, that equals exceeding great riches. And unfortunately, the brethren have set their hearts upon those riches. They have no interest in doing good with that money except making more money, buying cattle farms. Yes, once this SEC fine came out, the church did go from an absolute stingy 40 million 
to $1 billion given in charity. They have the power quarterly, four times a year, to use their wealth to produce another two to four billion dollars, and the tithing they get is seven billion annually. The reason they said they hid it from everyone is because they didn't want the members to stop paying their tithing. So they have set their hearts in their pride upon this exceeding great wealth because of the way they're hoarding it. Let's keep going. There's more shocking stuff that Bednar does in this talk that should spook Mormon people. Ancient voices from the dust plead with us today to learn this everlasting lesson. Prosperity, possessions, and ease constitute a potent mixture that can lead even the righteous to drink the spiritual poison of pride. Amen and amen. However, I'm going to emphasize up front here that Bednar presents a case of interpretation where he excludes the church leaders and he puts all of the onus upon the members and calls for them to repent. This is where I disagree with Elder Bednar. No one is exempt. Let's keep watching. Allowing pride to enter into our hearts can cause us to mock that which is sacred, disbelieve in the spirit of prophecy and revelation, trample under our feet the commandments of God, deny the word of God, cast out, mock, and revile against the prophets, and forget the Lord our God, and desire not that the Lord our God, who hath created us, should rule and reign over us. I would also add that that kind of pride can lead you to take so vast amount of wealth and just sit on it and do nothing with it in relation to the amount they can make and what they do possess right now, they give the stingiest amount of charity of the vast majority of other groups on our planet. Ultimate stingy. So he's going to say things that we critics are doing. It causes us to criticize the prophets. If you would be honest with all your dealings with all your men, if you would stop lying and hiding information that everyone deserves to have, then there would be no reason to rebel against you. The cause of the rebellion is not the people losing the Spirit of God so much as it is calling out the prophets for their deliberate choices to live a life of deception while being able to dress in very nice rich suits gather in filthy, huge, rich, mega buildings and preach God's word, such as that done at General Conference. That also is a poison mixture of pride. To say we don't apologize for anything is pride. The church has come out through Dallin Oaks saying the church apologizes for nothing. So that's my take on that, but it gets worse. Let's take another look. Therefore, if we are not faithful and obedient, we can transform the God-given blessing of prosperity into a prideful curse. 
if we are not faithful, then we can turn this pride into a curse, faithful and obedient. Yes, sir, Elder Bednar, that includes the church leaders. Nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the Book of Mormon, nowhere in the Doctrine and Covenants or the Pearl of Great Price can I find Jesus Christ saying to do with your exceeding great wealth what you are doing. The amount of enormous good the church can give is non-existent. They hoard the money for a rainy day. Your leader's words, not mine. So understand this applies to you as well. Jesus never taught to ignore the poor like you do in your own city of Salt Lake City. They are on the streets by the thousands. I'm not saying throwing money at it solves the problem, but you have the capability to solve that problem throughout your city, and instead you build up malls unto yourselves to help you gather more money which in the Greek is called mammon, which Jesus Christ himself says you cannot serve both God and mammon. You have to choose one or the other, and we have seen, based on the words of your own leaders, where the church chooses to put its heart. And this is not wanted to be talked about, in church. But those are the facts. Let's keep going. Because, unfortunately, it gets worse. That diverts and distracts us from eternal truths and vital spiritual priorities. We always must be on guard against a pride-induced an exaggerated sense of self-importance. Oh my! Now it's approaching hypocrisy, is it not? Who is more important than church leaders when they walk into a chapel and they insist on the tradition, no, it's not a revelation, that all stand. And you remain standing while that general authority walks all the way through the congregation, up onto the stand in front of them, elevated above them, so all eyes have to look up to the church leader. And once that church leader sits, then all are allowed to then sit, etc. So, not very convincing. Notice he is talking to the members of something that the leaders themselves dwell in nonstop. Let's keep going. Much more. Not much more, but much more. A misguided evaluation of our own self-sufficiency and seeking self instead of serving others. Yes, that mall was vastly more important for you to preserve your special heart of your city where your lawyers and your church buildings are instead of taking care of the poor like Jesus taught in the New Testament. You hypocrites, you profess Jesus with your lips, but your hearts are far, far from him. Let's keep going. There's more. I can do this all day long. As we pridefully focus upon ourselves, 
we also are afflicted with spiritual blindness and miss much, most, or perhaps all that is occurring within and around us. Which is exactly what Jesus taught you in the scripture, but you don't like what he has to say. You do the exact opposite. You want to say to everyone else, do as we say, don't do as we do. Let's keep going. It's brutal. We cannot look to and focus upon Jesus Christ as the mark if we only see ourselves. And that mall in the midst of the lap of luxury in order to build up your wealth even more is the ultimate selfishness. Let's keep going. There's more. Such spiritual blindness also can cause us to turn out of the way of righteousness. Like deliberately breaking the laws of the land because you've had your second anointings and you're above such things, which you did do with all of your investments, which has netted you to become one of the largest corporations in existence. And it's all tax free. Let's keep going. Fall away into forbidden paths and become lost. We believe in honoring, sustaining, and obeying the law. Unless, of course, we can hide our hundreds of billions from not only our church members, but from all the governments of the world, because we are a law unto ourselves. You are breaking the commandments of God. You are breaking the laws of the land, and you have fallen into taking forbidden paths. And this has been occurring for at least... 12 years and through three different prophets and a whole slew of Quorum of Twelve Apostles, although the majority of them also did not know what the first presidency was up to. Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson, and Russell M. Nelson are all aware that it was illegal what you're doing, what you have done, and how you're treating the money. And yet, you persist. Let's keep looking. There's more. As we blindly turn unto our own ways and follow destructive detours, we are inclined to lean upon our own understanding boast in our own strength, and depend upon our own wisdom. Yes, and is this not exactly the situation with the blacks in the priesthood, according to the church essay on the official church website? Is this not the exact situation that the church essay of the Book of Abraham admitted and on the Adam-God doctrine? and on a myriad and host of other issues. You yourselves are guilty of what you are talking about, and you're so spiritually blind, you don't even see it. Or if you do, once again, you're making the same life choices to deceive others so that they don't see it. After 12 years, it is a choice of life living, not just a mere human error by a fallible prophet. This is an ongoing issue that you are continually carrying as the chains of Satan around your nets, and he is dragging you down. Let's keep going. There's more. 
and I'm just using his own words and the Book of Mormon and the New Testament teachings of Jesus Christ. Samuel the Lamanite succinctly summarized the turning away from God by the Nephites. Ye have sought all the days of your lives for that which ye could not obtain. And ye have sought for happiness in doing iniquity, which thing is contrary to the nature of that righteousness which is in our great and eternal head. The prophet Mormon observed, the more part of the people remained in their pride and wickedness, and the lesser part walked more circumspectly before God. Now here is something that will probably offend a boatload of Mormons, I get it, but the more larger part of the people of the Nephites, including the church. There is no exclusion of the church in Samuel the Lamanite's prophecies. But the more part continued in their wickedness, hoarding their money, setting their hearts upon their great exceeding riches, and the lesser part began to be and kept their circumscribing with their God. Well, that describes today. There's a much smaller part of us who are taking exception to the life choice of the leaders being deceptive continually and cheating and lying and breaking the law to acquire vast amounts of wealth, all contrary to everything Jesus Christ taught. They allow the poor to wallow in their streets suffering because the church is grinding the faces of the poor by making the central part of their city where all of their lawyers and church offices and apostles and prophets and 70s hang out with wonderful, luscious, voluptuous malls so that they can buy all the goods of the world because they know you can buy anything in this world for money and they let the poor rot on their own streets. But there's more. I'm describing what I myself have witnessed in Salt Lake City. I'm not just trying to be a critic. This is serious. In the book of Helaman, the increasing righteousness of the Lamanites provides a stark contrast to the rapid spiritual decline of the Nephites. The Lamanites turned to God and were brought to a knowledge of the truth by believing the teachings in the Holy Scriptures and of prophets. And there you go. We poor are doing that. We are finding that what Jesus Christ taught is not what the church leadership is doing at all. So... This has a direct application, but notice how cleverly Bednar is going to switch this so that he assumes it's the church leadership who is being the righteous ones because they have the power of the pulpit in general conference. But I don't accept this, and here's why. Exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ repenting of their sins, and experiencing a mighty change of heart. And for the last 12 years, there has been no repentance of their sins in breaking the laws of the land and of Christ with amassing their wealth, with building malls, ignoring the poor, and other such heinous sins Again, from Jesus Christ's point of view, they love to profess Jesus on their lips. Yes, have faith in Jesus. But they won't do what Jesus says to do. He told the rich leader to give away not just a couple of percentage of his wealth, all of it. Now, have I done this? No, I have not. 
I am trying to take care of my family as well. But the church professes to be above average in spirituality and in tune with Jesus. Has Jesus changed his mind then and said, you know what? Forget about the poor. They're just a bother anyway. I know of nowhere where he has ever said such. Apparently, the leaders have an inside line where they're not supposed to continue taking care of everyone else, just themselves and their investments, so that they can keep making thousands of gaudy buildings, gaudy, G-A-U-D-Y, not godly, buildings to do whatever it is they do in all those buildings and ignoring the greater weight of the law, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, except the poor people on your streets. Now that's how the Mormon leaders interpret that great commandment of Jesus Christ. The proof? Go to Salt Lake City and see it for yourself. We're not done. I wish we were. This is becoming a horror show of pure hypocrisy. Let me make sure it's on. Yes, it's on. Therefore, as many as have come to this, ye know of yourselves, are firm and steadfast in the faith and in the thing wherewith they have been made free. Ye should behold that the more part of the Lamanites are in the path of their duty, and they do walk circumspectly before God, and they do observe to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. They are striving with unweary diligence that they may bring the remainder of their brethren to the knowledge of the truth. As a consequence of the righteousness of the, of the Lamanites did exceed that of the Nephites because of their firmness and their steadiness in the faith. Moroni declared, Behold, the Lord hath shown unto me great and marvelous things concerning that which must shortly come at that day when these things shall come forth among you. Behold, I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know your doing. So how on earth, knowing that, can the church leadership continue in choosing their life path of pursuing mammon is utterly beyond me except perhaps for the fact that they don't really believe what the Book of Mormon says anyway. Let's keep going. Please remember that the Book of Mormon looks to the future and contains important principles, warnings, and lessons intended for me and you in the circumstances and challenges of our present day. Amen, Brother Ben. Now here he's disarming his audience, us, because he said me and you, etc. But this involves the entire church leadership and their collective unifying agreement now to continue sustaining each other. Even though now, instead of just the First Presidency knowing about how they acquired their wealth and are not using it, now they've been sustained in General Conference. All of them, the 70s, the Apostles, and the First Presidency, are sustaining them in their actions of ignoring Jesus Christ's actual teachings and his desire for what we are supposed to do. It almost pains me to point this out. It should be obvious. But who's taking the Book of Mormon seriously and who's not? I don't think the leadership are. Let's keep going and I'll show you what I mean. Apostasy can occur at two basic levels, institutional 
and individual. This is the critical point of his discussion because he is correct. Apostasy can occur on the institutional level. My belief, based on all the evidence I've seen, is that it has happened yet again, even though of phony reassurances by those in charge. It's a circular reasoning. Let's keep watching. At the institutional level, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will not be lost through apostasy or taken from the earth. That's not true. Watch how he miscontexts this. It's amazing. In other words, you can't blame the leadership. Only you, members, apostatize. Us, we, nope, we don't apostatize. This is where I disagree with this gentleman. The prophet Joseph Smith proclaimed, the standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. The truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly, and independent till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear, till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. Yes, and notice he's insinuating that this means Joseph Smith is talking about the church. You don't hear the word church in that quote, however. Now, I have not had a chance to read the full quote. So, I honestly, at this point, don't know either. I'm open to correction. But the truth will go forth independently, Joseph Smith said. Regardless of what the institution says, he definitely says that. It's not just the church. It may not even be the church. No unhallowed hand can stop the work of the Lord from saving people. But Joseph Smith doesn't say it's through the church. Not in this part of the quote as Bednar is using it. He should make that clear if he wants to clear the institutional church. In my opinion, I believe this is very shady. At the individual level, each of us must beware of pride, lest we become as the Nephites of old. May I suggest that if you or I believe we are sufficiently strong and stalwart to avoid the arrogance of pride, then perhaps we already are suffering from this deadly spiritual disease. All of the life choices that I've seen, the top echelons of the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, make in regards to money, in regards to telling the truth about their history, in regards to hiding the child sex abuse scams that are going on, in regard to the heinous issues with Tim Ballard, whom the brethren propped up to almost be like the Savior, astonishingly enough, all of that indicates to me that they have already fallen into this disease of pride because of their exceeding great wealth. Their riches give them the green light in their minds to be above the law, but they are not but they imagine they are. Otherwise, why are they ignoring Jesus and breaking all the laws they possibly can to acquire that which cankers their own soul? And if they are doing it under the auspices of the church, then that is cankering the church's soul 
And that's the definition of apostasy. Let's keep going. We're about done. Simply stated, if you or I do not believe we could be afflicted with and by pride, then we are vulnerable and in spiritual danger. In the space of not many days, weeks, months, or years, we might forfeit our spiritual birthright for far less than a mess of pottage. It appears to me, and this is unfortunate, based on what we have learned about the church in the last 12 years, that you have not forfeited your spiritual birthright for a mess of pottage. You have forfeit, forfeited your spiritual birthright for the most astonishing mountain of money that we can't even comprehend, and that you abuse that blessing by hoarding it, throwing out a mere billion in charity only one time in order to be able to say, look how much we're giving in charity, but you steadily, consistently only given 40 million, and that would not have changed if you had not been caught breaking the laws of the land and the vast amount of wealth was exposed. In other words, you're doing it because it's expedient, not because you're spiritually enlightened. One more part, and I'll stop. If, however, you or I believe we could be afflicted with and by pride, then we consistently will do the small and simple things that will protect and help us become as a child. Submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon us. And the church leadership is not this way. Because we have the words of Jesus based on what Joseph Smith claimed in the New Revelations. And the church is not doing any of that. They don't believe in the law of consecration at all. They don't believe in helping the poor and succoring the needy at all. They believe in hoarding wealth. Now, they will throw out little teasers, you know, 40 million here, a billion there, etc. When in relation to the amount of wealth that they possess, that's less than 1% of 1%. But they love to crow about how righteous they are for giving so much, which is actually astonishingly stingy in relation to the blessing they have been given illegally acquired by themselves. But the Lord has not sought to take it away yet. Perhaps he's giving the church leadership a chance to repent and regain the spirit. Based on everything this gentleman is saying, the spirit cannot possibly be with the leadership. And this is what the Mormons do not want to recognize. I can't blame them. I can't blame them. Because it's a horror show of abject hypocrisy going on at general conference. The church leadership is exempt. The church is perfect. The members are not. That's not true at all. The church is the church leadership, and they aren't just fallible human beings who every now and then make a little mistake here or a little mistake there. They are making life continuous choices of unrighteous dominion and bad principles against everything Jesus Christ has taught. So that's my BYP response. I'm not crowing about this. I'm simply pointing out that the church really needs to take care of what they're actually doing based on what we have knowledge-wise. My personal suggestion is those of you who live in Salt Lake City, because I'm well aware that Russell Nelson has said that 
second coming of Jesus Christ, the work has hastened now without question, and it's closer than you think, and you had better get ready. My advice, get the hell out of Salt Lake City, because he's not coming to bless the church when he comes again. It's too wicked. Thanks for watching my BYP response. I'll be back with more as I have time.